I would see Jesus. Do you want to see Jesus? You all want to see Jesus? Well, unfortunately, time is running out for that. Yeah, time is running out in regards to our decisions on whether we're going to actually see Jesus in a nice way or in a different way. You know, last night we were studying some important things about Matthew 24. <clears throat> Matthew 24 talks about the signs regarding the second coming of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ is going to come soon. And there are certain signs in regards to that. But sometimes we get too caught up in the second coming of Jesus Christ. We get caught up thinking about the wonderful things about the second coming of Christ. And in Matthew 25, just to bring us a little bit more to, to earth... Uh, Jesus explains that the kingdom of heaven is like a certain thing. So this second coming of Christ that we're all excited about, it's like this. And in Matthew 25 verse 14, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. So what did he do? The kingdom of heaven is like a man. He is going to a far country and he gives to his servants some goods. And he expects something from them when he gives them those goods. The um, next verse says, And unto one he gave what? five talents unto another two and to another one to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey so he evaluated every one of them and he gave them certain things how much do you have you have one talent, two talents, five talents. What do you have? Who are you, by the way? You know, we take a look at people, we evaluate them, we judge them. Where's Zachary? He disappeared on me here. He was, I was looking for him a little bit earlier here today. I know he sang in the choir. Zachary disappeared. Oh, well, Zachary's not here. Okay, how about, maybe Nicholas can help me out. Why don't you come on up here, Nick? You know, I want us to toss up a thing. You know, we had these young guys here in our class this last year uh, in June. And, you know, we, we took a look, take a look here at Nicholas here. He's a nice young man. How many talents you got? I mean, he doesn't know. I mean, uh, when you look at this guy, who do, who do you see here? Who do you see here in front of us? Do you see... Um, do you see Pastor Nicholas here? Do you see that? We don't know what we see. Okay, we're looking at this young man. Or we see Dr. Nicholas. I don't know. What do we see? An accountant, you know? Who do you see? I don't know what we see. You know, but there's something that we miss many times. Did you know we miss something? And here's what we miss. It says here, many apparently unpromising youth are what? richly endowed with talents that are put to no use. Did you know that? A lot of young people, they have all these talents and they don't use them all. Why? Their faculties lie hidden because of a lack of discernment on the part of their educators. We take a look at young people, we look at them, we don't see what their potential is. And when this young man came to our class this last year, I don't know who this young man is. But I know one thing. What do I know? There's a lot of talents hidden there. And so, you know, we have an obligation before God. It says here, in many a boy or girl, outwardly unattractive as rough-hewn stones, may be found precious material that will stand the test 
of heat and storm and pressure, the true educator keeping in view what his pupils may become will recognize the value of the material upon which he is working. And so young men like this, and thank you very much for willing to come up. I knew he could handle coming up here. He did really well this summer here coming up and presenting his topics really well. You know, the thing is that we miss a lot of things as, as a church. You know, we have needs of pastors. We have needs of a lot of things. And we bypass people. We look at them and say, oh, this guy is not going to make it. You know, they sit in our children's Sabbath school classes and we look at them. Some of them can be quite troublesome. Did you know that? Some of these young kids, they come into Sabbath school and they are nothing but trouble. And you know what? I was one of those. You know, when, when they saw me coming to Sabbath school class, the teachers already went like this. Yeah, one time I remember, one time they, and I knew how to bother the teachers. I knew how to do it. You know, and I knew how to bother the other students in class too. And one time, you know, back in those days when boys don't want to sit with girls, you know, and, and I remember the teacher in my Sabbath school said, if you don't behave, I'm going to put you in front with those girls up there. And I knew those girls would be more upset with me sitting there than I would with them. So I pretended that, wow, this is great. So I did exactly what he told me not to do. Sat me in front there with the girls and the girls are terrified and getting all upset and everything else. He had to move me back anyway. And you know what? I remember I went back to Sacramento one time to do a wedding and uh, there were some people that left our church. Some of my former Sabbath school teachers were gone. And you know what they said? They said, we got to go to church. We got to go to church because they heard that I was going to be preaching. They said, we don't believe this. We heard that he's preaching, but we don't believe this. We got to see it. Why? Because apparently what? Unpromising youth. Uh, let's go back to that other statement there. What is it here? It says there, in many a boy or girl, outwardly as unattractive as what? As rough hewn stones. You know, how many people um, there in Africa, they found this ugly stone and somebody came there and said, look, I want to buy your property. And this property is full of these ugly stones. And they bought the property for practically nothing. And what the, were they stones? What were they? <laughs> they were diamonds. Somebody did not recognize these are diamonds. And sometimes we look at these young kids and we don't see that they are what? They're actually diamonds and have a place in God's church. You know... There are many things needed in the church of God. In Ephesians 4, 11, it says, and he gave some what? <coughs> apostles. Not all are apostles. And then you have some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. I don't know what you're going to be for the rest of your life. Some of you. We need a lot of pastors. And some of these uh, young people here are really rough looking stones to be pastors. And yet, that's who they are. Some of them are evangelists, some are teachers, some are educators. Now, why does God give these gifts in the church? Why does God give different talents, different abilities within the church? It says for what? Why do we need them? For the perfecting of the saints. Did you know you can't be perfect on your own? Did you know a diamond will never, that rough-hewn diamond will never look nice all by itself sitting there in the field or wherever else it may be? It has to be what? Has to be cut up and polished and beaten up and done all sorts of stuff. And you know, a lot of times we talk about coming to church and we don't want to come to church. Why? Because so-and-so bothers me. Well, you know what? So-and-so needs to bother you because you're never going to get polished by yourself. It doesn't work that way. So you see, God has a purpose for all these different abilities.
And the reason he puts us in church capacity, it continues there in Ephesians 4, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. People are out there to deceive you, to distract you, to catch you. And you know what? God places us in church capacity so that we are not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. You know, Satan's trying to do something. It says here, oh, how Satan would rejoice if he could succeed in his efforts to get in among this people and disorganize the work at the time when thorough organization is essential and will be the greatest power to keep out spurious uprisings and to refute claims not endorsed by the Word of God. You have all sorts of ideas coming out there, and God wants us to be protected, and so He puts us where? In thorough church organization. The very thing we want to be free from is the very thing that we need. And the reason He puts us in church capacity it says here, so we can grow up into Him in all things. To grow up properly, you need to have an experience. And how long are we needed in church capacity? How long do we need to come into church capacity? It goes on in verse 13, till we all come into what? Into the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You cannot come unto the perfect man, you cannot come unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ until we come into the unity of the faith. And how do we get to that unity of the faith? That's why we need different talents and different abilities within the church. You see, there is order in heaven. You think that uh, when we get away from this earth, we're going to have no more order? There's order in heaven. And it is to be imitated by those upon earth who are heirs of salvation. And notice this. The nearer mortals attain to the order and arrangement of heaven, the nearer are they brought to that acceptable state before God which will make them subjects of the heavenly kingdom and give them that fitness for translation from earth to heaven, which Enoch possessed preparatory to his translation. Are you preparing for translation? Well, part of that preparation for translation is church order. And part of that church order is the different talents that you received. Now, what's the smallest number of talents that you can have? What do you think? What's the smallest number you can have? Zero. No, not zero. What is it there? One. What did he get? The smallest number was what? One. one. That means everyone has one. You have at least one. Did you know that? You have at least one talent. And what do you think you should do with that one talent? What do you think you should do with it? It says here, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. What happens when you take the one talent that God gives you and you work with it with all your might? What happens with it? It becomes better, and not only does it become better, but guess what? There's another verse here that's really important. So if you have one talent, and you really work hard with that one talent, and that one talent, you want to make it the best talent possible, it says, he that is faithful in that which is what? The least. How much is the least? Least is one. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in? In much. That means that you are going to increase the talents that you have. So how do we practically increase our talents? It says here, those who have received only one talent 
should resolve by God's grace to use it wisely. So right now, you may have only one talent, but if you resolve to use it wisely, it is going to increase. Keep again in mind, what is the purpose of talents? Why does God give you abilities? So every one of you that are sitting here today, why did God give you those talents? What are they there for? They're, God made it very clear. What did Jesus say before he left the earth? Go ye where? Into all the world to do what? To preach the gospel to every creature. So what's the purpose of your talents? Why, do you, why did God give you a talent? To what? To give him glory. Yes, how do you give him glory? By using it to what? To preach the gospel. Now, preaching the gospel is not always. By the way, for us to preach the gospel right here, you know, there's these young guys over there on that table over there uh, doing all this stuff, uh, sending it out through the internet, recording, doing all that stuff. You know that's part of preaching the gospel? Did you know that? Did you know that part of the preaching of the gospel is over there? Because right after we get done with this message, suddenly you all, as the message starts winding down towards the end, what happens? Your stomach decides to say, hey, you know, remember me? Yeah, and what happens if there's none of that? Guess what? All of that is part of preaching the gospel. And this is why we need to understand where all of our talents belong. So now, how do you successfully preach the gospel? Number one, when the heart is given to God. Our talents, our energy... Our possessions, all we have and are, will be devoted to his service. So if you're serious, if you've really given your heart to the Lord, I don't care what your occupation, and some of you may be having an occupation that is really comfortable. Yeah, right now, some of you may be having a nice occupation. It's comfortable. You're making good money. You're doing what you like to do. And then God says, I need more of your time. And I need you to preach the gospel. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to pack up and say, okay, let me go get, get rid of my nice paying job and let this go and do service for God? You know, William Miller, we talk about William Miller. We mentioned him in our Sabbath school class today. William Miller, he was a successful farmer. His farm was doing good. And what did he do? He left it all behind to do what? To preach the gospel. Are you going to do that? Are you really prepared to do something like that? Now, you know, we talk about a lot of different talents over the years. And you know, there is one talent we don't often talk about. But you know what? There is one talent that God's going to really talk to you about. And you know what that talent is? Our time belongs to God. Every moment is His, and we are under the most solemn obligation to improve it to His glory. Of no talent He has given will He require a more strict account than of what? Of our time. And so, yes, this morning, I want us to talk a little bit about this talent called time. And what do we say what do you hear so often today? I don't have... <laughs> that's, that's not true. You actually have time. But what do you have time for? You know, how do you have time? God has given you sufficient time for everything that you need. So the question is, how much time do you have? Did you know... That in Job it says, is there not an appointed time to man upon the earth? Did you know right now you have a certain amount of time on this earth? Did you know that? And that time, that's it. I, I met a little boy younger than your age, and he died. You know what happened? His time ran out. So you don't know how much time you got. You may think, I got lots of time. 
But you know, there is an appointed time that everyone has on this earth. And the problem with our time is what? Remember how short my time is. Right now you're thinking, wow, time. I got lots of time. You know, you're all thinking, you know, at your age right now, you know, uh, 20 and under, you're thinking to yourself right now, you know, when I am 40, that's going to be old. You can hardly think of 40, not to mention 60. 60, they're probably ready for the grave. But you know, when you're over 60, you're looking back, and what do you find? There's not that much time. Time is short. And you know, there's something we realize the older you get. You know what happens the older you get? It says here, the human family have scarcely begun to live when they begin to, to die. Yeah, you just get used to life. You just get used to things and all of a sudden you start dying. Yeah, I was just in the middle of all these things. I'm getting ready. I'm excited. There's a lot of things I want to do. You know, when I was younger, man, I can work, you know, 20, 30 hours straight, no problem. Not 20, 30 hours every day, okay, you know, but a couple times a year, you know, I, I did at least once a year, sometimes 72 hours straight, I had to do things. Things were important, you got to do it, you can't stop it, you got to go for it. You know, and, um, you know, it was almost like you're invincible. And then all of a sudden you hit 40 something and guess what? You're all excited. You got all these plans and projects and everything else. And all of a sudden there's some strange thing that happens. You get tired. <laughs> it's like, what's going on? You know, this is not normal. I'm used to working longer. And that's when you begin to realize that you scarcely begin to live when you begin to what? You begin to die. And the world's incessant labor ends in nothing less, nothingness, unless a true knowledge in regard to eternal life is gained. Let me tell you a secret here. You know, right now, I know a lot of you come to this country. You, you come from poverty. You come to this land, and it's like, wow, we can make some money here. And what happens? You begin working and working and working and working. And next thing you know, it's time to die. And I'll never forget the friends that I had here in Canada years ago. They came with good intentions. They came to this country. He was telling me that he came over here. He actually came to go to missionary school. You know that? He came. He heard, he heard that in North America there's a missionary school, so they immigrated to Canada so they can go to missionary school. And the missionary school somehow closed it around that time. They got busy, they got busy working, they, they, they started into construction, got into construction business, was working day and night, you know, and, um, you know, uh, got married and started building their own house. They had two kids already, and wow, life was going good. And, you know, one day, you know, he goes out there, he was building his house, and he jumped down on something, and uh, he broke his ankle. <laughs> And his wife said to him, what kind of a fool are you? Stupid, right now we need you working. And you go there and you break your ankle. And they got into a fight. Yeah, they got into a fight. You know, so he's sitting there in bed, you know, with his leg up, you know, you know. A week later, his wife broke her ankle. <laughs> and they're both sitting in the bed next to each other, <laughs> looking at each other. You know, we hadn't seen each other in a long time, you know. And basically, yeah, they, they, they grew up. They, they lived life. They were so busy. They, re they, they, they re didn't realize you begin to live and you start dying. And then what is it all worth? What is your house? What is your value? What is, your, what is everything that you have worth? You know, they, um, we were building a church there in Shahola, Pennsylvania. And uh, I was gone one weekend, and um, they came to work there. And uh, he didn't bring his measuring tape and his apron, so he borrowed mine. And I was out in California at the time, and I come back, and uh, he broke my measuring tape. <laughs> and so he left a note to me. And in the note, he says there, you know, 
Sorry I broke your measuring tape. I'll repay you in the earth made new. <laughs> it was a good funny joke, you know. <clears throat> anyway, when it, him and his wife, they, uh, they were working there together. Then they finally got their senses together. They realized, you know, they've lost their kids. They need to spend a bit of month maybe together with their kids. And, um, and right after that, they went to Europe and... Um, he landed in Frankfurt, Germany, and he drove over to Croatia. And on the way there, the, um, the entire family got killed in a car accident. You know, the family of Charlie Golubovich. You know, this is what it is. We don't realize that we can go through life. And you know that sense, and then I read that, that I threw the note away, I wish I kept the note, you know, I threw it was a nice joke, but seriously, he says, I'll pay you, pay you back in the earth, man, yeah. You know, the work that you're doing, the life you're trying to build, everything you're trying to accomplish in life is actually nothing. It can be taken away like that. The entire family of four people died. I don't think the kids were uh, 20 yet. It's nothing unless you have a true knowledge in regard to the eternal life is gained. You have absolutely nothing. And this is why going back to time when we talk about parents, parents, it's so important for you to remember that those children don't have a lot of time. Before you know it, you're going to be saying goodbye to your kids. They're gone. And this is why parents cannot commit a greater sin than to allow their children to have what? Nothing to do. Why? Because time is of the essence. How much time do you have? And this is why it says here, Whoso keepeth commandments shall feel no evil thing. And a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. A wise man evaluates two things. What? Time and judgment. Those are two things. And so in your life, how much time do you have? How much time do you have? Yeah, it's nice. We need to live in this world. We need to have a place to live. Yeah, and, and there's nothing wrong having a nice place to live. But when our focus is on a place to live in this world, and we do not consider the judgment, we do not consider eternity, then what's the value of all the time that you have spent on developing these things? So again, what is the purpose of our time on earth? You know, when we look at the advent of Christ, it's interesting there in Galatians, this verse always intrigued me. It says, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under a law. In other words, it was related to time. The moment the time came, what happened? That moment, Jesus was born in Bethlehem. That moment, he was born. And when Jesus looked at his ministry, the very beginning of his ministry, he had just got baptized. He just went through the wilderness there. And now after that, John was put in prison. Jane, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. What was Jesus preaching? The gospel. Do you think Jesus knows what the gospel is? Yeah, do you think Jesus knows what the gospel is? And now notice the words Jesus used in preaching the gospel and, and saying, now notice he is preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and he says, the time is fulfilled. Did you know that the fulfillment of time is the preaching of the gospel? Yeah, that's the word, that's what it says. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Of course, he was preaching Daniel 9. 
And Jesus wasn't in a rush with his time. He knew how much time he had. He didn't have a lot of time. He had only three and a half years. But what did Jesus do many times? They urged him to do something that will cause trouble. And what did Jesus say? For my time is not yet full come. It's a good thing. Yeah, I need to do that, but not right now. Why? Because my time is not full come. So right now you're looking at your time. Some of you have less time left than others. And some of you think that that old man over there, he doesn't have a lot of time, but I have lots of time. And you can leave this place here and get in a car accident. Your time is over. Yeah, that, that, that can happen. You, you have all your plans, all your goals, and everything else. And so don't think that you have a lot of time because all of us are on borrowed time. Yeah. And since we have borrowed time, what are we going to do? Notice this verse in Ephesians 5, 16. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. If you lost an hour yesterday, can you make up for it? So you're going there in university and you go there and you, and you decided instead of restudying for your test, you decided to have a nice evening together with somebody else. Have some nice time with your friends. And the next morning's the test. What, what are you going to do about it? Can you make up and say, oh, let's make up some time? I'm going to stay up later, later on. What happens later on? You're more tired than you started. How do you redeem time that has gone back, past? Number one, time that is lost is gone forever. Let's understand that. We are admonished to redeem the time, but time squandered can never be recovered. Oh, I wish I had studied when I was younger. Oh, I wish I paid attention more to class when I was younger. Guess what? Time is gone. We cannot call back even one moment. The only way in which we can redeem our time is by making the most of that which remains. How? By being co-workers with God in His great plan of redemption. Every one of us here have lost some time already. Did you know you've lost some time already? Did you know that? Time is already going past you like this and you think I got lots of time and time has just disappeared. So how are you going to make use of the time that's lost? You can redeem the time by making the most of the time that remains. How? By being co-workers with God in His great plan of redemption. By saving souls. That is how we can redeem the time. There is no other way to redeem the time. Because time gone is gone. And this is why Jesus speaks to all of us. This verse is not just for a few preachers. Go ye where? Into all the world and do what? And preach the gospel to every creature. You see, God has given you some time to do what? God grants men the gift of time for the purpose of promoting his glory. Yeah, one of you said that already earlier. To glorify, what was it you? To glorify God. That's what we're here for. That's why God has given each one of us the gift of time. Now is our time to labor for the salvation of our fellow men. You know, there are some, it says here, who think that they give money to the cause of Christ. And this is all they are required to do. The precious time in which they might do personal service for him passes unimproved. God needs money, but you know what? He needs you more than he needs your money. Did you know that? He needs you more than he needs your money. Some of you are making good money. Some of you are getting ready to go to school to make good money. But God needs you. 
God already has them all the money he wants in the world, you know? Did you know God has all the money he wants? God can create money out of nothing. Now, God can do a lot of things. But he needs you. How many of you are prepared to look at all the opportunities you have right now and say, wow, I'm making a lot of money right now, but you know what? That's not satisfying my soul's need. And I'm going to leave this money-making business and I'm going to preach the gospel. Are you ready to do that? To let everything go? God needs you. It says here, but it is the privilege and duty of all who have health and strength to render to God active service. All are to labor in winning souls to Christ. Donations of money cannot take the place of this. You know, 40-something years ago when I came to Canada, we had a church in Puss Lynch and we had a church in Toronto. And 43 years later, we have a church in Puss Lynch and we have a church in Toronto. Uh, we had something in Montreal back then too, by the way. A little group there back there in Montreal. I think we've only added what? Ottawa? Why? You know, brethren, it's time for every single one of us to evaluate ourselves. The time that we have to prioritize so that we can have a church in every single province, so we can have a church in every single city here. Brethren, we have an obligation, and God is looking for you, not just money. And not just money to sit in the bank account and say, wow, we got this nice bank account here. What we need, God needs, is you. But you know, sometimes I find people, they want to work. They want to have a job in the church. And they're not taking care of their business very well. You know, here's something else here. The Bible also says what? Romans 12, not what? Slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Years ago, I remember someone saying, Oh, maybe we can hire this person. He doesn't have a job. Well, guess what? Something's wrong if they don't have a job. No, that's, that's what it is. They need to be what? They need to be busy, not slothful in business. Indolent, careless habits indulged in secular work will be brought into the religious life and will unfit one to do any efficient service for God. Did you know that? Some, I've had some people tell me, oh, I don't want to spend my time doing any secular labor. So they do nothing to take care of their own family, and they say, I'd like to be a Bible worker. Well, guess what kind of Bible worker they would be, according to this statement? What kind of Bible worker would they be? They won't do anything. In every moment, if every moment were valued and rightly employed, we should have time for everything that we need to do for ourselves and for the world. Did you know that? If you looked at your time and managed your time, you got plenty of time to do everything that you need for yourself and for the gospel's sake. That means there's a lot of stuff we don't need to do for ourselves. There's a lot of things we don't need to do. And of course then, we can then share this message. I do need to read this one. Heaven bestows upon us very large gifts when it gives us opportunities. Those who are ever desiring greater opportunities seldom show that they appreciate the opportunities they have. God gives you opportunities. God gives you everyone. You have opportunities. God gives you those opportunities. But we cannot possibly do this unless we are closely connected with Christ. Those who are vitalized by His divine nature can and will work in Christ's lives. That means we need to be born again. To be able to do all this with our time, we need to be born again. And when you are born again, 
It's going to change your priorities. The things that you have, you think you have to do, suddenly you don't have to do them. A lot of this has to do in youth. And as a young person, you can change what you're doing. It says, it will be difficult now for you to make the change in your character which God requires you to make because it was difficult for you to be punctual and prompt in action in youth. Now's your opportunity to change your direction in life. When you are young, you have an opportunity to change how you do things. You then need to prioritize your time. And we're not going to read this right now. But you see, prioritizing our time, being on time, because delays are virtual what? Defeat. So whenever you have a delay, when you're not on time, when you don't begin on time, it's a defeat. And again, there's a lot of other things we can look at here. But I'm going to cl close, near the closing here. In Romans chapter 13, this is a very important verse. And that knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of sleep. It's time to wake up. Did you know that? Did you know it's time to wake up? It's time to wake up. Why? For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. In other words, we have less time now for the second coming of Christ. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. My dear brethren, the Lord is calling you. The Lord is calling you today. This verse here, I think, is, I think this is a nice verse to close on, actually. You know, the night is gone past. And what are we doing in regards to the end of this world? Today I'm making an appeal to every one of you to value your life. Especially those of you who are busy. Those of you who are not busy and you have time, well, you need to evaluate your life on how to do your secular work faithfully. To make sure that you are busy. Those of you who are successful, those of you who have accomplished things, those of you who are young people who have big plans for your life, God needs you. God needs you today. God needs you to sit down and put away some of the plans that you have and decide to serve Him without reservation. I have heard the in an accepted time. And in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Time is running out. What are you going to do with the time you have left? You know, our closing hymn is 574. We know not the time when he cometh. At even or midnight or morn. It may be a deepening twilight. It may be at earliest dawn. He bids us to watch and be ready, nor suffer our light to grow dim, that when He shall come He may find us awaiting and watching for Him. You know, this morning, as we sing our closing hymn, maybe some of you here today realize that something's wrong with your time. That you need to change what you're doing with your time. Maybe some of you here today, you feel that you're not capable of changing it. You've tried many times. You've tried many times to change your direction in work and direction in life, and it's just not working. You need help from God. I'd like to invite you as you are, we are singing our closing hymn, that if you want help from the Lord to manage your time in a different way 
you come forward that we can have a special prayer for you so that you can change the direction of your life and be among those who are waiting and watching for him. Let us sing our closing hymn.